Hello everyone and welcome to your next lesson, Misleading Information, AO3. Hopefully by now you feel really comfortable with the AO1 section of Misleading Information. So you're able to describe Lotters and Palmer's research and you're able to describe post-event discussion and how that affects eyewitness testimony. The reason I didn't record a video for last lesson is because there were some videos for you to watch during the actual PowerPoint and I hope you found those useful. But if you do have any questions about the AO1, please let me know. This lesson, we're going to recap research into misleading information. So we're going to look over Loftus and Palmer a little bit more. And we're going to evaluate research on the effect of misleading information on eyewitness testimony. So in relation to Loftus and Palmer's study, how, what are the strengths of this? What are the weaknesses of this? So for your start, I want you to take 10 minutes and feel free to grab your textbooks and grab your notes from last lesson to help you with this. I want you to answer four questions, maybe five, if you're feeling up for the challenge. So number one is to identify the independent variable in Lotus and Palmer's first study. So what did the researchers manipulate? What did they change? And number two is to identify the dependent variable. What did Lotus and Palmer measure? And remember, when we're stating independent and dependent variables, we want to operationalise the variables. So we want to make them measurable and we want to make them testable. So in other words, we're just making it very specific. Number three, which type of experimental design did Loftus and Palmer use in both experiments? Uh, remember, the way I taught you to remember what this is asking for is if we look at the middle of the word experimental, we see R-I-M. So we've got repeated, independent, or match pairs. So what was the experimental design that they used? And what is one strength of experimental design? Now this is a three mark question. So we want to make it relevant to Lotters and Palmer's research, not just a generic strength of this experimental design, but in relation to this specific experiment. And if you finish that before your 10 minutes is up, I want you to answer the three mark question, explain how post event discussion might create inaccuracy in eyewitness testimony. So I want you to just pause this video now and take 10 minutes to answer the question and then we'll go through the answers. So question one was identify the independent variable in Lofters and Palmer's first study. So two marks. One mark you will be awarded for saying that the independent variable, the thing that they changed, was the verb that they used in the leading question. An extra mark is for stating the verbs, so try and remember them. Smashed, collided, bumped, hit and contacted. It's always good practice to state all of the conditions in a certain experiment. It really shows the examiner that you really know the study in a lot of detail. Then number two was identify the dependent variable, so what did they measure? And one mark for speed slash estimated speed. And then the second mark is for operationalizing this variable. So saying, how are you actually measuring this? And very specifically, we're measuring it in miles per hour. So they took all of the participants' responses and they had an average miles per hour response. Question three, which type of experimental design did Lotus and Palmer use in both experiments? Was it repeated, was it independent, or was it match pairs? It's just one mark, so one mark for identifying that it was independent group design. And this is because each condition was tested by a new group of participants. And what is the strength of using an independent group design? One strength is that it reduces order effects. You might have a different strength, so give yourself a mark if you feel like your response is quite worthy. And then you get the extra mark for elaboration. For example, you could have said, if Loftus and Palmer's participants had taken part in multiple conditions, so using a repeated measure design, they may have worked out that the verbs were being manipulated and consequently the aim of the experiment, a phenomenon known as demand characteristics. This could have led to a change in their response which would have affected the validity of findings. So remember, demand characteristics is when participants change the behaviour because they act the way that they think the researcher wants them to act. And that affects the validity because we're not actually measuring misleading information on the accuracy of eyewitness testimony. We're measuring how well 
participants respond to the demands of the researchers. The challenge question was to explain how post-event discussion might create inaccuracy in eyewitness testimony. And even if you didn't answer this question, it's just a quick reminder for, uh, from last lesson. Post-event discussion refers to a conversation between co-witnesses or an interviewer and an eyewitness after a crime has taken place. This might contaminate an eyewitness's memory for the event. The memory of an event may be altered or contaminated through discussing events with others and or being questioned multiple times. This might create inaccuracy in eyewitness testimony. So you see in this question, you have to explain what post-event discussion is and then relate it to eyewitness testimony. How does it affect eyewitness testimony? And that would get you the three marks. So now we're moving on to the evaluation part of the lesson and we're going to answer this essay question. Outline and evaluate research on the effect of misleading information on eyewitness testimony. And the way we're going to do this is I'm going to give you a point and you're going to give me the evidence and the explanation. So you're going to write me a appeal from the point that I give you. And we're going to do this three times and then I'll give you two further evaluation points so that you have five altogether. So your first point is that one issue with Loftus and Palmer's research is that it lacks population validity. So using this as your point, complete the evaluation paragraph by writing your evidence. So I want you to talk about the sample that they used and explanation, why does this matter? Why is this an issue to the research in general? So I want you to pause me now, write the peel, and then we'll go through it together. So the point one issue with Loftus and Palmer's research is that it lacks population validity. As evidence, you could have written something such as they used a restricted sample of 45 American students to test the effect of leading questions on the accuracy of eyewitness testimony, which makes the experiment culturally biased. So you see that. I've made it relevant to Loftus and Palmer's research. This matters because the results can't be generalised to the wider population. Thus, we cannot accurately know if other cultures would be susceptible to the effects of misleading information and we are unable to conclude whether misleading information affects the accuracy of eyewitness testimony in other countries. So your appeal that you wrote might <clears throat> look a little bit different to this. But as long as you've got a good piece of evidence, it doesn't have to be too long. And an explanation of why that is a strength or a weakness, a weakness in this case. And then always relate it back to misleading information and the effect on eyewitness testimony, then it's all good. Number two is one strength of Loftus and Palmer's research is the application of their findings to the criminal justice system. So this is a strength. So I want you to use this point and complete the evaluation. So as evidence, you can look at evaluation number three in your textbooks if you need some help on what evidence to include. And explanation. So why does this matter? Why is this a strength? So pause me now and we'll go through it together. So evaluation issue number two is that one strength of Loftus and Palmer's research is the application of their findings to the criminal justice case. Evidence of this, the criminal justice system relies heavily on the accounts of eyewitness and Loftus and Palmer's research highlights the danger of misleading information being used in the courtroom by lawyers as a single misleading question can affect the accuracy of eyewitness testimony. This matters because their research is useful as it can help ensure that courtrooms operate fairly and that innocent people are not convicted of crimes they did not commit on the basis of inaccurate eyewitness evidence. So again, we've made it very relevant to Loftus and Palmer. We've said, we've given them a good piece of evidence there and we've also given them an evaluation issue of usefulness in the explanation. So that is a good peel. Okay, so the third and final peel that I want you to write is another issue with Loftus and Palmer's research is that they deceived the participants and therefore did not adhere to a code of ethics. So when we're talking about ethics as an evaluation issue, it's a really good opportunity to double what a peel paragraph. It's because you can say it was an issue that they broke the code of ethics. However, it was necessary because of this. 
So if you're up for a challenge, I want you to try and write it as a double Loftus. If not, just write your evidence. So in Loftus and Palmer's research, how were they deceived? And an explanation of why this matters and include an evaluation issue in your explanation. So you can pause me now and go through that. So your last appeal should look a little like this. Your point is that another issue with Loftus and Palmer's research is that they deceived their participants and therefore did not adhere to the code of ethics. As evidence, you can say that they didn't tell the participants the true aim of their research and therefore did not abide with the BPS code of ethics. And this is your double whopper. It could be argued that deception was necessary in order to obtain valid results. If Loftus and Palmer had told the participants that they were going to be misled, this could have led to demand characteristics where the participants changed their behaviour and therefore affect the results of the study. As an explanation, you can write, as it was unlikely that any of the participants were harmed from this study and all of the participants were debriefed, the deception in the study was of strength to ensure the collection of valid data to further our understanding into the effects of misleading information of, on the accuracy of eyewitness testimony. So again, in your explanation, you've linked it back to misleading information and the accuracy of eyewitness testimony, and you've also included an evaluation issue, validity in this case, the validity of the data. So here are the final two evaluation points, and you can peel these if you want, and I'm happy to mark them if you send them over, but I'm not gonna go through them in the same way that I did the other three. But another strength, is that there was research support for the effects of misleading information on eyewitness testimony. And this was done by Braun et al. Basically, college students who had visited Disneyland as children were asked to evaluate advertising material about either Bugs Bunny, who isn't a Disney character, or Ariel, who wasn't around at the time of their childhood. And those who were assigned to either the Bugs or the Ariel groups were more likely to report having shaken hands with these characters than the control group, even though neither Bugs or Ariel were at Disneyland when these college students were there, which again supports the idea of misleading information having an effect on eyewitness testimony. A negative is that results may be affected by indigi in, sorry, individual differences. So Shakta et al found that compared to younger subjects, elderly people have difficulty remembering the source of the information. So they know something, but they're not sure how they know that, who told them that. They are therefore more prone to the effect of misleading information when giving testimony. So they're more likely to be affected by these leading questions or by having conversations with other people about a certain event. The effects found in Loftus and Palmer's research may be hard to replicate amongst all age groups, making results less reliable. Because remember, reliability is all to do with rep replicability. If you can't replicate the results of a study, it means that the results, the study itself, is not very reliable. So that is a negative. So that's all for today's lesson. Next time we're going to carry on with eyewitness testimony, but we're going to be looking at the effects of anxiety. And Again, as always, if you have any questions about anything, um, especially about this lesson, or if you want me to check through any of the appeals that you've done, if they look slightly different to mine, I'm happy to do so if you just send me a quick email. Okay, thank you.